Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the US dollar Russian ruble. You can see, I want to pull this one up first. Uh, you can see that finally it's giving way. It took a lot longer than I thought, but you know, we had the FOMC statement today. That's going to be the bulk of what we're going over. But before we do that, I want to look at some of the charts. Here's the euro. So you can see in the short term here, let's get down to the five minute. You can see the short term reaction there. And uh, kind of interesting, it was actually after the market had closed, a lot of the action spike there happened. But this is with the FOMC statement. And, you know, it's really ridiculous that any group of people should have that much power to move markets. The fact that the markets move that much on a statement by a person um, in the Federal Reserve or anywhere uh, means they have too much power. That's just by definition. Um, whatever power they have needs to be taken away from them because they should not be able to move markets with stupid statements. And we'll see, we'll, we'll look into and see how stupid the statements are. Now, uh, I wanted to address a little controversy going on here. This is a video that Chris Dwayne did. Jennifer brought to my attention. It's called You Can't Eat Silver. And it's truth never told. And it's about, it's, um, he's talking about storm clouds gathering. And I did a video on him in 2012. I called it shill clouds gathering. And, uh, so I just wanted to address one of the comments here, this Aaron Scott, just to give you an idea of, you know, where I'm coming from. So I put a comment on here saying, in my opinion, the guy's a paid shill and gatekeeper. And I'm not the only one. Now, this guy came out bashing silver. At the same time, he's telling people, as Jennifer pointed out, you know, to not pay their taxes. You know, he lives over in France. He's telling people to not pay their taxes, not obey the government, you know, overthrow the government, do all this stuff. Um, so I'm going to read this comment by this Aaron Scott to what I said here. And just, just to show you the kind of mind games that are played in these issues. Well, hello there, John. Pleasure to meet you. I've really enjoyed your bids over the last couple of years, too. I respect your opinions and cannot answer to that possibility of being a paid shill. Uh, just like the debate on Jim Rickards, well, the, guy, the guy's CIA. I mean, come on. <laughs> uh, I don't know and don't care other than to say, and I'm, not, I'm sure you'll appreciate this, John, I want to see the good in everybody. Okay, well, that's the difference between you and me. I don't want to see the good in everybody. I want to see the bad in everybody. In other words, I want to know what evil motives they have, who's paying their paycheck, who's paying them off, why they're doing what they're doing. Now, why do I believe that? Well, because I know what my motives are. And I know that I'm not being paid off. And I can tell you that Stormcast Gathering has 500,000 subscribers on YouTube and he has millions of uh, views on some of these videos. It's a known pattern that the insiders blow these people up. They take the people that they control. They make them big. They lead the sheep uh, right into the slaughter. It's a pattern that repeats over and over again. So yeah, I'm very cynical. And there are many qu quotes out of the good book referring to the devil hiding in the truth or there being a a little sin in us all. Apparently you've never re really read the good book because that's not in there. With the level of social destruction we are witnessing and what is about to engulf this world, I personally want to stay focused on the good in people. Again, whatever. I, I have learned a lot in the last few years from all those that are sharing information that can and will help people like Alex Jones. Really? This guy, this Jesuit educant or whatever it's, however it's been out, this guy is a transparent gatekeeper. Uh, his temper is a little gross at times. Yeah, because, y you know, he's controlled. But he serves a purpose for the greater good. No, he doesn't. I love all. N no, you don't. 
And I would love to see those in our group of like-minded people start move on to more constructive focus. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, and that's buying silver. And that's what's constructive. That's going to be the thing that's going to fix things and put these bankers down. But guess what? Storm Clouds Gathering is telling you that it's a foolish idea to buy silver. Like, once the system has collapsed, what are we going to do to rebuild things? Well, you're not going to rebuild anything if you don't have any money. And if you don't have gold and silver, you're not going to have any money in such a way that this blank never happens. Again, I would love to see a large round table solely focused on the next paradigm. I'm new to the YouTube thing and just started doing some videos, but I'm way down the road on making changes in my world and assisting my community directly. I do a radio talk twice a week here in the Valley, and there are hundreds of people here. Blah, 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 blah. I work with people that count their ounces in the thousands and our conversations resolve, revolve around rebuiding a local textile industry or for me to help people with solar water off-the-grid systems. I also grow huge amounts of organic produce, teach people how to grow and store their food. So what do you think? Want to get together and have a discussion like that? Let bygones be bygones. This is whatever. No. No. Because I've been around this area for 10 and 20 years and I know how these people operate. And they follow the same pattern over and over and over again. They come in and they speak a certain amount of truth and they get a whole bunch of people on their side. As soon as uh, they're in the community and they start to get a bunch of followers and get people behind them, uh, then they're either compromised. I really honestly don't know how that works. There were rumors going about that there were the Chinese, there was one rumor about the Chinese making offers to people in the alternative media. There's other people talking about how they get a knock on the door or a call on the phone or whatever. Someone meeting them saying, hey, you know, I, I'll slip you a couple million dollars, you know, and, and, and then we're going to tell you what you can say, what you can't say, and, and the, what you need to promote. I don't know if those stories are true. I can tell you perfectly honestly, that's never happened to me. Uh, whether I, I don't know why that's not the case. I, maybe they know I don't have a price and it wouldn't work. I really honestly don't know. And I don't know if those stories are true. I just judge these people by what they say and try to figure out what their motives are by what they're doing. And that's the kind of pattern that I see. So let's look at this statement by Yellen here. Um, this is the... Oh, did we crash? Um... So we'll go ahead and reload that. But this is the uh, statement that Yellen made today. And I want to read a little bit of the Zero Hedge uh, article on that. And that is uh, titled, Here is why the Fed can't hike rates even by 0.25%. Now I'm not going to read the whole thing. It goes into a long drawn out thing, but basically the reason why is derivatives. So let's read a little bit of this here. In short, what Posner is saying is that in a world in which the traditional broker dealers and banks have indeed reduced leverage and instead used 2.5 trillion in the Fed reserves as fungible collateral against which to buy credit derivatives, for example, in the case of JP Morgan CIO offices in an attempt to corner the IG9 market, the buy side community, which as we have long discussed, has largely avoided equities due to fears of spectacular market implosion and certainly minimized levered exposure in the space with the exception of several prominent HFT participants, has instead been forced to chase after fixed income products and chase with leverage that would make one's head spin as can be seen in the outlier chart above. So that is the reason why um, they're, they're terrified. They're, they're scared. In fact, I'm going to call this old yeller, old yellow, old yellow yelling. And they're terrified. And the reason why is because they can't raise rates. And uh, they could just trigger this catastrophe. So let's take a look and listen to the Fed chair today. And I'm just going to try to comment. We're going to take as much as we can and then um, let it go. I want you to notice something here right at the beginning. Of, let's, let's listen here. You hear that? Sounds like machine gun fire. Now, you know, back in the old days, the the cameras, you know, they snap, they're snapshot, you know, shutters snapping. 
Uh, does that still happen? I don't know, but that doesn't sound like random shutters snapping to me. It sounds like someone pounding on a typewriter or using a machine gun off in the distance. I don't know what that's about. Good afternoon. As you know, the Federal Open Market Committee this afternoon reaffirmed the current zero to one quarter percent target range for the federal funds rate. Zero to one quarter percent target range. Grandma, you're starving grandma. You understand that? We also updated our forward guidance indicating that an increase in the target range for the federal funds rate remains unlikely at our next meeting in April. With continued improvement in economic conditions. Let me translate all this gobbledygook for you. Um, we are giving forward guidance that we may be giving forward guidance that we may be giving forward guidance that we may be giving a policy guidance that we may be thinking about raising rates at some point, though we won't tell you when that is. Conditions, however, we do not want to rule out the possibility that an increase in the target range could be warranted at subsequent meetings. Let me emphasize, however, that the timing of the initial increase in the target range will depend on the committee's assessment of incoming information. Today's modification of our guidance should not be interpreted to mean that we have decided on the timing of that increase. In other words, We're not saying just anything. because we remove the word patient. Oh, oh, they changed one word. Markets moved hundreds of points. They changed one word. From the statement doesn't mean we're going to be impatient. What kind of Orwellian doublespeak is that? Just because we removed the word patient does not mean we are going to be impatient. Wow. Moreover, even after the initial increase in the target funds rate, our policy is likely to remain highly accommodative to support continued progress toward our objectives of maximum employment and 2% inflation. Maximum employment? What does that mean? Is that everybody employed? Because you got 93 million people out of the labor force. So that apparently is not even close to maximum employment. That number is still growing. And we're going to talk about that when she mentions some other numbers that just make that ridiculous. And then your target of 2% employment. Why is it your target that my money should lose 2% of its value every single year? Why? Why do you want that? And by the way, inflation is not what you say it is anyway. You're talking about a change in prices. Inflation is an increase in the money supply. That's what inflation is. I'll come back to today's policy decisions in a few moments. But first, I'd like to review economic developments in the outlook, which form the basis for our policy decisions. We've seen continued progress toward our objectives, our objective of maximum employment. The pace of employment growth has remained strong, with job gains averaging nearly 290,000 per month over That's not even the rate that the population is growing. The past three months. The unemployment rate was 5.5% in February. That's three tenths lower than the latest reading available at the time of our December meeting. Broader measures of job market conditions, such as those counting individuals who want and are available to work, but have not actively searched recently, and people who are working part-time but would rather work full-time, have shown similar improvement. What? So U6 and the other measures of unemployment are improving as well. How can it be that these other, all measures of employment, you have your official unemployment measure, 
then you have the part-time workers, discouraged workers, and then you have U6, and you have uh, all these categories you're talking about. You say they're all getting better. Why is the labor force participation rate getting worse? That doesn't make any sense. Where are these people coming from that aren't working? As we noted in our statement, slack in the labor market continues to diminish. Meanwhile, the labor force participation rate the percentage of working age Americans either working or seeking work is lower than most estimates of its trend. What? Is lower than most estimates of its trend? What kind of gobbledygook is that? And wage growth remains sluggish, suggesting that some cyclical weakness persists. So yeah, she'll talk about wage growth here later on. Um, when they're asking her about, I actually had to listen to this whole thing. I fell asleep. It, part of the question and answer thing, but she's asked about wage growth, and of course, this is the Fed. Um, yes, oh, absolutely, yes. If we see see wage growth, then yes, so we would definitely consider raising interest rates. Why? Because if you haven't figured it out by now, the Fed's your enemy. The Fed's the friend of the Wall Street banks and all the rich point oh 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 one percent who have their money in all these uh, assets that no one else does. But if your wages actually start rising, oh my heavens, uh, we've got to raise rates to stop that. So considerable progress clearly has been achieved, but room for further improvement in the labor market continues. We continue to expect sufficient underlying strength in economic growth to support ongoing improvement in the labor market. After averaging about 2.5% over 2014, growth of real gross domestic product appears to have slowed in the first quarter of this year, in part reflecting a moderation in household spending. In addition, the, in, the recovery in the housing sector remains subdued, and export growth looks to have weakened. Looking ahead, however, the committee continues to expect a moderate pace of GDP growth with robust job gains and lower energy prices supporting household spending. Inflation has declined further below our longer run objective, largely reflecting the lower energy prices I just mentioned. Declining import prices have also restrained inflation. And in light of the recent appreciation of the dollar, will likely continue to do so in the months ahead. Okay, so the three things just cited there are the price of oil and imports, and she also talks about exports, but then she mentions these all have to do with the dollar. So you'd think that maybe somebody at, at the, questioning her would ask her, hey, why did the dollar just gain... 15 or 20 percent of its value since last summer. What, what's going on? Why why is the dollar so strong? Why is there a 25 percent rally in the dollar from 80 to 100? What, what's causing that, Janet? You haven't raised any rates. What's going on? You think someone would ask that question? You think they wouldn't have to ask that question? You think she'd just answer it? Nope. My colleagues and I continue to expect that as the effects of these transitory factors dissipate, and as the labor market improves further, inflation will move gradually back toward our 2% of two percent objective over the medium term. Okay, I'm going to stop there. So that, there's your move in the currencies. She called these moves in the dollar transitory. Uh, I, I would like to take a look at the sell-off. Maybe someone parsed the language because as Zero Hedge pointed out, it was after the market closed. We got this boom explosion right there, 4 p.m. right on the dot, 4 p.m. This is the euro. Here's the yen. 4 p.m. boom. Here's the Swiss franc. 4 p.m. British pound, 4 p.m. And crude oil, 
didn't do anything at 4 p.m., but it took off based on her remarks. So what's going on? Well, old Yeller, I'll call her, is is in trouble. She wore her little yellow sash there. And uh, the bottom line is the Fed is afraid of raising interest rates. And the reason why I cited in that Zero Hedge article that this entire house of cards could come tumbling down so they just keep kicking the can down the road. Uh, they have to be more and more careful about even mentioning that when they're going to even think about raising interest rates because the markets could react violently to that. And after all, we're talking moving from point, moving from 0, 0.0 to, to 0.25, from there to 0.25 to 0.5 or something. We're talking about nothing as far as interest rate changes go. Uh, Percentage-wise, it might be large. From going from zero to anything is large, but in the uh, scheme of history, you know, a half a percentage point interest rate is absolutely ridiculous. That's unprecedented, and they've had that near there for six years. So um, the Fed is in the box; uh, they're still in a box. Old Yeller uh, is afraid to raise rates, probably with good reason, because this whole house of cards is going to come tumbling down. Silver definitely sniffed it out. You can see um, as soon as she opened her yapper here, maybe this is when the dollar comment came. I don't know. We went from 15.60 to over $16 really fast there. Same type of move in gold. Now, this is not traditionally what we get. Normally, what we get is no matter what the Fed says, whether it's bullish, bearish, neutral, they're immediately waiting in the wings to give a massive smackdown just to uh, reaffirm in the sheeple's minds that it's the Fed who is suppressing these prices and the Fed will continue to suppress these prices. And it doesn't matter how you read the tea leaves of what the Fed says, they're going to take gold and silver down. That has changed here and changed fairly dramatically this time. The reaction was definitely one of a very strong rally. You can see that right there. That downtrend was broken, although this big resistance line now that's hovering around 1190 or 1200 uh, on gold and with silver, we're talking about uh, the price that's around 1620. So we're actually closer. We need to get through, really get through $17 on silver to confirm that uh, some type of bottom is in based on this statement. Um, I would not be at all surprised if tomorrow morning when the market opens up at 8.30 uh, on the COMEX that we see a massive crushing uh, coming in. Um, if that doesn't happen, that could be a possible turnaround. And we'll talk to you next time.